Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 36 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Forums are free and open to all, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Jean Robinson is a retired bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire. Since 2013, he has served as a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, speaking and writing on issues of poverty, racism, immigration reform, LGBTQ rights, and the full inclusion of transgender people in American society. In 2014, when Brittany Maynard's struggle with terminal cancer brought national attention to the issue of medical aid in dying, he began advocating for expanded end-of-life choices. Recently, Bishop Robinson has been speaking on behalf of the nonprofit organization Compassion and Choices, which supports state-of-the-art care and a full range of options to ensure comfort, dignity, and control for terminally ill people. Tonight, he will offer a theological context for choice at the end of life. We welcomed Bishop Robinson to the forum in June 2010 when he spoke on equal rights for LGBTQ people. Please join me in welcoming him back to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Bishop Gene Robinson. I am delighted uh, to be back in Minneapolis. You know, uh, Minneapolis has a, uh, is a, a, very warm spot, a very warm spot in Episcopalians' hearts for Minneapolis. Uh, we did two dramatic things here in Minneapolis. Uh, in 1976, we passed legislation that changed our canons that allowed uh, women uh, to be ordained. And in, uh, yes indeed. And uh, in 2003, uh, after my election by the Diocese of New Hampshire, uh, I was consented, that election was consented to uh, by the in, entire Episcopal Church, and um, I became a bishop, which, uh, as you may recall, caused no small amount of controversy. It's nice to actually to be in Minneapolis without bodyguards. <laughs> it's much easier to get around. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to be back. Uh, tonight, I want to speak about something um, that at first look might feel difficult. Uh, the, uh, probably the only thing people like less to talk about than death is their own death. Uh, it reminds me of the fellow who said to his wife, um, if one of us dies, I'm moving to Wisconsin. It's just easier, isn't it, to think about someone else's death uh, rather than our own. It's a topic that is uh, pretty much irrelevant to young people and is a, a, a kind of annoyance to uh, middle-aged people because they are reminded that, no, they haven't yet called the lawyer to do their will, to do their uh, powers of attorney, and so on. But I have to say uh, that at age 69, uh, it's it's getting my attention, and I've pretty much figured out that I can no longer maintain that I'm middle-aged, because I'm apt not to live to be 140. <laughs> the other thing that makes this difficult to talk about is that, honestly, there are no experts on this topic. We don't get to practice this before we do it. Sometimes we get to live through that experience with someone else, but at the end of the day, it turns out to be a solo experience, doesn't it? Even if you're surrounded by family and friends and loved ones. Uh, so that, that makes it hard. I want to be really clear with you that I'm just speaking for myself tonight. Uh, and I will tell you, as I think about this, what I want for myself but I would not presume to tell you what you should want or what you should decide for yourself. 
I will advocate for you to have all the options that you possibly can as you make those decisions about how you want to live the end of your life. And I will suggest to you that you do have some decisions to make, and I would recommend that you make them sooner rather than later, because on your deathbed is probably not the best time to have your first thoughts about these. I will speak also from, from my perspective as a Christian with a, a deep respect and tradition in the Jewish tradition. But if you're from some other faith tradition, I, I will trust you to be an adult and to translate uh, my Christian Jewish language uh, to fit into your own faith perspectives. Or if you are no faith at all, uh, see how that interfaces with how you're thinking about these issues. How did I get interested in this? Well, um, actually I was interested in it quite early on. While I was in seminary, um, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came out with her her book. I mean, I was there at the beginning of this, right? Um, and I, I was fascinated by the topic and fascinated about ministry to people uh, who were dying. And I did a quarter of uh, clinical pastoral education. I served as a chaplain to all the terminal patients at Mass General Hospital in, um, in Boston. Um, and that was uh, very formative for me. The real reason I'm interested in this is Ernie. Ernie was in my very first parish in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And he and his wife became just dear friends of mine. And ultimately, they actually moved to New Hampshire, uh, where I lived. And at, when he was about 60 years old, Ernie got pancreatic cancer. And his wife asked if I would be a, a part of the very small group of people who would nurse him and see him through his dying. And I did that, and it was really, really hard. The thing I remember most about it is that no matter how much pain medication we administered to him under doctor's orders, the look on his face was sheer panic. And it was very clear that despite that medication, he was in excruciating pain. And it made me angry. I don't know what he would have chosen uh, other than this, but what I did know is that he didn't really have any other options. And so while I didn't have any language to put around it, I, I knew that I wanted to do something about that. And, and I wanted to do something about it because I could get pancreatic cancer and I could be in that kind of pain. So medical aid in dying or death with dignity are the, are the names that we give to uh, legislation that permits a doctor to give a prescription to someone who fits the following criteria. Someone who makes one request for this medication and then in 15 or more days later makes the same request again. That keeps it from being just sort of a, a, a passing whim. Two doctors have to certify that this person is in his or her right mind of a sound mind, not depressed. Two witnesses who are unrelated in any way to, to the uh, person requesting the prescription, that is to say, not a child, not a parent, not a brother or sister, and not anyone named in the will. <laughs> yeah? Uh, there are concerns about that, right? Two unrelated witnesses have to uh, attest to the fact that this is what this person wants. And this person has to be able to self-administer that prescription. Uh, th that's a tough criteria, right? And not everyone uh, will make this choice, but those who do um, have this, this option available to them. Not a lot of people uh, take advantage of it, even though it's now available in five states, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Vermont, and just recently, uh, California. 
which is kind of interesting because California tends to be a bellwether, right, for the rest of the country. But in, in the period from 1998 to last year, 2015, in Oregon, where they've had this law for that long, only uh, a little over 1,500 people in those 17, 18 years have requested this prescription, and only about two out of three have chosen actually to take it. Some of them have had uh, occurrences like a stroke that, um, pr uh, that don't permit them to self-administer. Some people who actually wanted to go this route but are prevented by that particular restriction. Others who just, who got the prescription for their own peace of mind and then decided not to go that way at all. And I want to say uh, one thing right from the very beginning, which is that suicide is the wrong word to use to describe this. Someone who is committing suicide wants to die. People who use death with dignity, medical aid, and dying want to live. They want to live. And most of them have pursued every possible way of continuing to live. And yet, as these doctors certify, they must be within six months of dying, in their best opinion. So, I'm arguing that this ought to be uh, an option for us. So let me tell you what I've learned in my pastoral ministry. I've found that a lot of people have a kind of a romantic idea of how it's going to be on their deathbeds. Uh, they're going to be surrounded by family and friends. They're going to be fully conscious. They're going to be able to speak. And they are looking forward to saying their last words. They may want to forgive someone or they may want to accept forgiveness from someone. They may want to offer advice to the younger members of their family. They might even wax philosophical or poetic. And it is seldom like that as many of you undoubtedly know. And the one thing that I hear the most beside a deathbed, besides the phrase, I love you, is he would have hated this. He would have hated this. This is not him. This is not how he would want to be in the world. So more often than not, you're hooked up to a machine, you're medicated and woozy, you're in and out of consciousness or not conscious at all, you're unable to communicate. It's sometimes grim. So here's what I want. I want death with dignity. Now, dignity is something we ought to be talking about more. We all use it, we all toss it around, but my guess is each of us means something different by the word dignity. So it seems to me that we might want to get together in groups, whether it be in church or synagogue or, or uh, social groups or whatever, and talk about w what do we mean when we say we would like to maintain our dignity in dying. For me, that means a kind of uh, a maximum autonomy and participation in the process, and a minimum of treatment and attitudes that would infantilize or exclude me. I want to be a part of this process as much as I possibly can be, and I want the people around me to be protective of me and my wishes. You know what I mean. You know when hospital staff and maybe even some of your family are talking about you like you're not even in the room or you can't hear them and we feel uh, helpless and condescended to that's what I mean by dignity and I encourage you to think about what conditions would you feel like main helped you maintain your dignity through all this well, I'm clergy, so I want to talk about what does God think about this. Now, first of all, let me say that anyone who claims to know what God thinks about anything, run. 
run away as fast as you can. Those of us who are in the religion business and those of us who are people of faith can make some pretty good guesses about what God would want for us, but a certain measure of humility um, is in order here, and no one should be claiming to speak for God, uh, no matter how certain they are. And anyone who tells you that the ethical dilemmas around this issue are simple, or black and white, or right and wrong, um, they are not serving you very well. They're trying to shut off discussion about this. They're trying to shut off the notion that there's any gray area, right? I don't care where you come out on this. Even if you're absolutely opposed to such an arrangement by the law that you could, that you could have this medical aid in dying, even if you're opposed to it, for goodness sakes, don't pretend it is simple. I think that's disingenuous. I'm not afraid of dying. As a person of faith, honestly, I, I have quite a lot of confidence in whatever comes after. I don't even know the details, but I don't need to know the details because I believe I know God. And so it's not, it's not being dead that, that concerns me, but I am afraid of suffering. And I think we have a lot of pop theology going on that if you stop and think about it for a moment, it says some terrible things about God. So one of the things you hear in these debates a lot are uh, something like, you know, when your number comes up, it just comes up. Well, if you push that to its logical conclusion, it, it kind of says the decisions you make in your life don't make all that much difference. It's kind of all been uh, predetermined. I know I'm uh, in, a, in a Presbyterian church and maybe talking about predestination here, so I apologize to anyone that um, might be offended. But here's what I, I don't believe. I don't believe we are pawns. I don't believe we are puppets. I believe that God was acting in good faith when God gave each of us free will and that it's not just free will to choose this or that. It's, it's the free will to, to have agency, to take responsibility for our lives and in some real sense, be a co-creator with God of our lives. And so this, your number, if it comes up, it just comes up and there's not anything you can do about it, just rubs me the wrong way theologically. Another thing you'll hear is that suffering is good for you. Really? <laughs> not all suffering is redemptive. Now, sometimes it is. If I asked you to mention the two or three most important things you've learned in your life, my guess is that two out of the three will relate to some painful experience that you've had, maybe even physical suffering, but certainly emotional suffering. And, and we can learn from suffering, but not always. Can you imagine looking at your son or daughter or parent in the midst of excruciating pain and telling them, honey, it's good for you. If, if we can be that pastoral, surely God is more pastoral than that. And so I think we need to get over this notion that, that suffering is a good thing because sometimes it's just gratuitous suffering. We also hear that it's not right to interrupt the natural course of things. Then don't take an aspirin when you get a headache. And when you get a pain in your side and you think it might be appendicitis, don't worry. You're gonna learn something really important when your appendix bursts. We are interrupting the natural course of things all the time. And many of us in this room are of an age where we've already outlived our natural course of things by two or three decades. If we had let the natural course of things take their course, a lot of us would be already dead. And lastly, you'll, you'll hear that we're trying to play God in all this. Well, we already are. 
we are already partners with God in creating our lives and even around medical issues. When you decide to put a do not resuscitate order on someone's chart, if you uh, decline yet another round of chemo or radiation therapy because it, you know it's gonna make you sick and ruin whatever time you do have left with your family and you just decide you're gonna do without it, or you have that horrible decision to make about taking the feeding tube out of someone that you love. It, life is, is about important decisions that in fact, are so important and, and go so deep, it does feel a little like playing God. But then again, Scripture tells us that we are made in the image of God. And so those kinds of decisions kind of come with that territory. And one last thing, actually. The Hebrew Scriptures say that uh, Yahweh tells us to choose life. But I want to say that the definition of life is more than a beating heart. And I'm not interested in someone keeping my heart beating come what may. That somehow if my heart is beating but my brain is dead, I'm still alive. I don't consider that the kind of life that God means when God says choose life. I would also say that in this debate, we need to not just have freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. I don't mind anyone else deciding that this movement to create legislation that makes the, this end of life decision possible, I don't mind them opposing that at all. But it doesn't feel right in the United States of America where we believe in the separation of church and state and the freedom of religion that I be forced to live by someone else's religion that has been forced upon me. And that's what's going to come up in your legislature this coming session around this issue. There are going to be people saying that you can't make this decision because they think it's wrong. And I encourage you to get active about that. So here's, here's what you can do. First and foremost, you can start thinking about this yourself and overcome the resistance to always be talking about somebody else's death, but not your own. Think about these decisions and talk about them with your spouse, your children, your parents, your brothers and sisters, all of those whom you love. And second of all, I would encourage those of you who are involved in a faith community of some kind to talk about these things as a community of faith. What do you think God thinks about this? What do you mean by dignity? What do you want for yourself and your loved ones? And if you decide that you would like something like this option, that you would like the option, at least, of choosing medical assistance with dying, then sign up with Compassion and Choices, who are who's going to be sort of spearheading this campaign next year in your Minnesota legislature to make this a possibility for you. I'm working on it where I live. On November 1st, the City Council of the, of the District of Columbia will vote on whether we have this choice or not. And I'm doing everything I can to make that true. Let me end with uh, just a, uh, a quick story. Uh, it's from uh, World War I. Um, there were three soldiers who um, were all from upstate New York, although they didn't know each other, and they met in France uh, in the war. And when one of them was killed, the other two uh, went to the, a little village, which had a, a, a beautiful little church with a, a, a little graveyard and a picket fence and so on, and they found the priest who was the priest of that church and asked if they could bury their friend there. And the priest asked, well, is he baptized? Well, they hadn't actually talked about that. They didn't know, and, and, and that's what they told the priest. And the priest said, well, you know, you have to be baptized uh, to be buried in the... Um, 
in the graveyard by the church, uh, but you can bury them just outside, which seemed kind of second class to them, but they didn't have a lot of time, so they did. They buried him just off the northeast corner and, and put a rough stone there just to mark it. And after the war, on their way back home, they wanted to pay their final respects to their friend. And so they go back to, the, to that little village and they look off the northeast corner and there is, uh, there's no stone, there's no sign of any grave. And they're alarmed and they find the priest and they say, what have you done with our friend? And the priest says, you know, it wasn't long after you left that I thought, what an, what an awful thing I did. I mean, I was abiding by the rules, but I was treating you and your friend awfully, so, so I moved the fence. <laughs> I moved the fence to include your friend. I actually think that what this effort to create legislation that makes medical assistance in dying possible is, is, is just that. It's, it's just an expansion of the options that are available to us to be as compassionate as we can at the end of life. And for a few people, this will be the option that they hope for. The question is, uh, will we do the work to make that possible? I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop Gene Robinson. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker this evening is Bishop Gene Robinson. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and the co-sponsors of tonight's forum, the nonprofit organization Compassion and Choices, and the online news source, MinPost. We invite you to join us for our next forum on Thursday, November 17th at noon, when presidential historian Timothy Naftali will be our speaker. That's one week after the presidential election. Further information is available at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Bishop Robinson, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. You referred, you referred to a, a five states. I, you referred to five states, and I think there are a number of other countries where death with dignity has been passed. Now, for some years, what have we learned from this experience where, where this has been practiced? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, five states at the moment, but I, I believe the count is uh, slightly over 20 states that are considering this, uh, either in the current session or the next one coming up. So, so it really is uh, making its way uh, around the country. Oregon um, is, uh, is the state that has had the longest experience with this. And by the way, I, I really um, uh, urge you to see the documentary called uh, how to Die in Oregon. Is that right? How to Die in Oregon. Uh, it's the story of some people who actually made this choice and follows them uh, all the way to the end. Um, uh, not all of whom are able to have this choice at the end because something happens that they can't self-administer the prescription. Um, um, this prescription uh, shows that uh, after about five minutes you fall asleep and after about half an hour you peacefully die. Um, it, it's very moving. Here's, a, I think, maybe the, the, the thing that you might be questioning. In the, since 1998, when they passed this law in Oregon, there has not been one reported case of abuse of any kind with this, right? There are all kinds of safeguards that, that uh, uh, prevent uh, this being uh, abused in some way. And as I mentioned, there are not a lot of people who choose it, but those who choose it uh, really very, very much want it. Um, the, uh, 
uh, Brittany Maynard that uh, was referred to early on uh, had to move. She, she contracted this horrific brain cancer two months after she married her young husband. They were both about, I think, 32, 33 years old. Um, and she was looking at several months of uh, excruciating and, and debilitating seizures. Uh, she was experiencing increasing pain. They tried everything to arrest this and nothing worked. And she had to pull up stakes. She and her husband and her parents moved to Oregon so that they would have this option. And, and she made her husband, Dan, who is just uh, such a wonderful human being, made him promise that he would do everything he could to get this legislation passed uh, around the 50 states so that others would not have to do what she and her family had to do uh, in order to have this option. So I, I think most people in Oregon would tell you, um, and the other states uh, with less years of experience, um, that it has been very, very positive for the people who chose it and has little or no effect on those for whom uh, it's not their choice. What are the major uh, areas of pushback or the major criticisms in the process of, of getting this legislation passed? Well, uh, as with so many other things, religion is, is a big obstacle. Uh, I mean, that's not news. Um, unfortunately, the beloved church, uh, the beloved synagogue, uh, can be our worst enemy in this. And I think it goes back to those, um, uh, th those uh, pithy little sayings that, that we use to calm our own anxiety about things which, if you look at them carefully, turn out to say terrible things about God, right? Because here's the thing. This option, this medical aid and diet, requires a kind of high, dignified view of humankind. That, that we are not just pushed around by, by the whims of fate or even by a God who wants to control us, but in fact, we are called uh, to be made in the image of God, to act as if we are made in the image of God, that we can make these decisions and be responsible and that God will be with us in that journey. It's just too easy to say life at any and all cost. That's just keeping your heart beating. And I would argue it's not life. And is it complicated? Yes. Are, th are, there, um, uh, are there difficulties in figuring out what is the right thing to do? Absolutely. But hello, welcome to the world, right? And anyone who would tell you that it's, it's a simple, simple thing to say no to, I just, uh, I, um, it makes me angry. Uh, just because a decision is hard doesn't mean we can't make it. Today's New York Times has an article on a movement called VSED, Voluntarily Deciding to Stop Eating and Drinking. It appears legal and effective, and within two weeks, generally, a person who has stopped eating and drinking dies. And it's not painful. Now, can you describe this uh, as an option uh, ac acceptable to those who would speak of death with dignity, or is it, is it a different kind of path? Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps you could describe it as death with dignity uh, for those who don't have this option, right? But I would actually question the notion of that, that it's not painful to starve to death or to dehydrate oneself to death. Um, uh, Diane Rehm uh, uh, on National Public Radio uh, out of uh, Washington uh, went through this with her husband and uh, she's going to retire soon and, and devote her entire uh, time to this, to this issue. Uh, he did not have this option and he desperately wanted to put an end to his own suffering and that of his family and so he did that. He starved himself to death and it took the better part of two weeks I think and um, according to Diane Rehm, uh, it was uh, uh, a heart-wrenching experience for all of them. But he didn't have this option. And it seems to me that um, 
uh, that depriving oneself of water and nourishment is is a kind of self-imposed torture that um, that is not terribly worthy of us. And um, I would have a hard time uh, getting over my anger. If that were me, I would have a hard time getting over my anger and feeling <clears throat> dignified about it. You have a number of questions coming forward about people living with dementia. And uh, I wonder if you might comment on, on uh, death with di uh, dig dignity with death and dementia. Yeah. So th uh, this is one of the difficult things. Um, uh, it doesn't apply in this case because they're, they are not within six months of, of dying. And they have to have two doctors who say that they are within six months of dying in order to get this prescription. And as, as you well know, most people with dementia are, are, are in perfectly healthy bodies or are, uh, certainly not within six months of dying. And so uh, these, these uh, safeguards are there uh, uh, partly because it, it protects the most people and, it, and it's partly, frankly, it's uh, politically um, uh, appropriate to put these uh, safeguards on it, because then when you get to that situation, then you know, uh, how demented do you need to be for this? You know, and then you get into some very, very gray areas um, and disturbing areas. So, so uh, it would not apply to uh, people with dementia. There's, a, there's an apocryphal story, I don't think it's true, but it's something to think about, about someone who wanted this option uh, and got, you know, uh, uh, and who had dementia and wrote on the bottle, um, uh, if you read this and you don't know what it's for, drink it. <laughs> now, like I said, I want to be really clear. I don't think that's a true story. But it does, it does raise some of those um, gray area um, uh, uh, questions that, that this poses for us. And so I just want to be really clear. It, this... Um, this legislation would not cover people with dementia unless they were physically within uh, six months of dying. What we're talking about this I'm evening right about is... That, right? I'm not right about that. We're getting... Oh, that's right, of course. Yes, it would not cover them at all because uh, they have to be able to make the request. They have to... And in fact, you'll, you'll see in the uh, How to Die in Oregon, uh, the person administering the drug uh, will say to the person who's about to take it, do you know what this is? And do you know what will happen if you drink it? And so the, the person with dementia uh, would not be able to do that and therefore wouldn't qualify anyway. And there's no kind of power of attorney or medical director that can be created? No, for that there's not, uh, that's not built into the law at all. Okay. Uh, we're talking in a way about a human issue, a moral issue, a religious issue. It is also a political issue. And this is the political season, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> uh, and for some odd reason, this issue hasn't come up in the presidential debates. No uh, issues have come up in the presidential <laughs> debate. <laughs> that was a setup. Well done. Thank you. Thank uh, you for being my street do, man. Do the, the two major political parties in our nation have a, a position on death with dignity? Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I suspect not. I think probably they think it's too hot a potato. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. What I, what I do know is that um, the, the issue that, that faces us, I, I do believe, is what kind of country do we want? And, and we're going to be fighting over the next several years, this comes out of my LGBTQ work, about what is religious liberty? What is religious freedom? And uh, what am I required to do? What may I decline to do because of what I say I believe? These are all really, really important decisions. And the clearer we can begin to think about those, uh, the better it is going to serve us in dealing with issues uh, like medical aid in dying. And, and I really meant what I said, that I, I believe that what the writers of the Constitution meant was that not only would we have freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. And the Establishment Clause seems to me uh, argues for uh, no one religious 
a set of one set of religious beliefs should be imposed on the whole. And at the moment, we're kind of uh, caught between uh, those two. And, and it will it'll probably wind up uh, in the Supreme Court if we ever get a full Supreme Court again. And so it's a human issue, a, a moral issue, a religious issue, a political issue. It's also an economic issue, is it not, uh, in terms of a prolonged life of medical care that might be provided someone over many months or years, perhaps. But uh, insurance companies must have a stake in, in this settling this question. What, what's an insurance company position on death with dignity? Um, I don't know what uh, insurance companies have said publicly about this. Uh, I think, remember that we are talking about a finite uh, uh, period of time. Uh, we're not, I mean, we're all gonna die at some point. We're all terminal in that sense. But this law would apply to people uh, for whom two doctors can say, in six months, they'll be dead. So you're not talking about years and years and years of, of, of financial um, uh, strain. I do know that, uh, and you, I'm sure you know, that people who are in uh, the st um, later stages of dying often worry about this, draining their own uh, resources, their family's resources, and so on. Um, and so I, I do know that it is uh, on the minds of those who are dying, uh, but it does not seem to be the, the driving uh, force uh, in, in the people that I know who have exercised this right. Um, it does not seem to be uh, the reason that they are doing it, although I think it is a little bit on everybody's mind. A number of questions have, have come forward about palliative care and hospice care. Here's one from a doctor. As a palliative mm -hmm. medicine physician, I'm personally neutral on this topic. I want people to have choices. I do worry about people choosing aid in dying out of fear of suffering. I have helped manage and control pain of many patients with pancreatic cancer successfully. Mm -hmm. Can you please comment on the underutilization of palliative medicine and hospice care in relation to this movement? Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I think we've gotten better at either knowing about palliative care or taking advantage of it. I'm, I'm uh, distressed to hear that that uh, this person feels like there's a, a need for that. One of the, one of the things that um, uh, that Compassion and Choices is working toward is letting uh, everyone know what all of their options are, of which palliative care is a really, really important one. This, this law is not for everyone. It's for the few people who might choose it. And for most of us, hospice care and palliative care, and, and, and frankly, I think we're getting better at managing pain. Although, I, I must say, my own experience is that sometimes when you uh, uh, successfully manage the pain, you have successfully uh, so depressed the systems of, of the person that they are not able to uh, uh, take advantage of still being alive, not being in pain, to talk with their families or whatever. So it's, it's, a, it's a very individual choice, and everyone should be reminded of what all of their options are, right? And, and which is why I'm encouraging you to talk with your, with your spouses and your children and your brothers and sisters and so on, and with your physician and with your, your rabbi or your priest or your minister, or whatever, uh, because at the end of the day, you're the one who just should decide about you. I think we all want that. Uh, you know, I was, I was saying to the clergy earlier today, uh, there's an, there is an appropriate time uh, for... Uh, for, for sacrifice, there's an appropriate time uh, to bear suffering because God has something to teach us. But I don't believe God causes the suffering. I think God brings something good out of something uh, terrible. That's, my, that's what my faith tells me. And so 
Uh, I think we should talk with all of these people. We should be informed by the very best science possible. And, but then ultimately, we should be able to decide and decide amongst as many options um, as are possible. Uh, this is a question from yours truly. Uh, I was with uh, uh, one of our parishioners a week ago. On Wednesday, he died. Uh, I was called out by the family and had been visiting him for some weeks, and, and the wife said he was probably going. In fact, he was, and I spent about 45 minutes visiting with him, and uh, we talked about his life. He was perfectly lucid and present, and we laughed and cried and, and uh, had a wonderful conversation. It was a culmination of probably three or four weeks of work with him toward this point. Uh, he died a little over an hour after I left him. But part of our work to get to that point uh, made me feel as if he was participating in his own death. And mm -hmm. part of the reason he was is because we talked about what would happen after his death, about the liturgy. We planned the entire memorial service. He, he chose the hymns and the texts and who would speak and, and the tone of the service. Are there liturgies or uh, rituals that have grown up around this movement uh, for death with dignity? Yeah, not that I'm aware of, but um, as families always do, we, we create liturgies, don't we? I mean, they may not be formalized, they may not be um, uh, uh, typed up in uh, uh, Word 2016, but we all have rituals that we follow in our families. Uh, but wh what I want to say about the story that you just told, when I'm talking about dignity, and including people in decision-making, not being condescended to and talked down to, not being talked about as if you're not in the room. It, it seems to me that that's as, as close to a good definition of dignity uh, as, um, as I can come up with. And think of all the, the little indignities that people in hospitals, for instance, have to bear. I mean, aside from being a little bit funny, those uh, Johnnies that are open in the back, Really, a lot of people are embarrassed and offended on behalf of themselves uh, you know, to put someone in, in that kind of an outfit in a public place and wheel them around on gurneys in hospital uh, corridors with all kinds of people. There are all kinds of things at work to reduce your own sense of dignity and privacy and having some kind of reasonable um, control over your environment. And, and, and what you just um, described, Tim, is, is just the opposite of that. It is ennobling, it's empowering. I mean, th this is what we all hope for, right? That at the end of one's life, you feel like you, you have some power over not only the present, but like how your life will be celebrated. I mean, this, this is what we all hope for. And I think it's a, a great example of the way in which we can uh, uh, stand under and understand the need for dignity that someone might have and what a comfort it can be to someone uh, and can make one's passing uh, really uh, peaceful in the, in the deepest sense of that word. In the movement for medical aid in, in death, is there a difference between people of faith and people without faith or people who approach this from a secular perspective? I don't know if any um, uh, research has been done on that. I mean, uh, again, it's, it's such a small sample and uh, most states have not had a really long time uh, to do this. I suspect it will be um, uh, done in the future. but. Here's, here's the alarming thing for, for a clergy person. Uh, we find that people of faith don't live their lives all that different from uh, people who would not consider themselves people of faith. You just I, let our secret out. That's I know, <laughs> I know. Don't tell. All of you uh, listening on uh, Minnesota Public Radio, please don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed about that, I'm alarmed about that, because we ought to be living our lives in such a way that people want what we've got, right? And the fact that there might not be all that much difference um, uh, is, is alarming to me. On the other hand, let's, let's remember that there are, are, are people um, with uh, great worth and great dignity and, and great... Um, 
uh, make a great contribution to all of us uh, in society uh, who don't identify with a particular um, uh, branch of faith. And so um, yeah, I'd, like to th I'd like to think that there is a difference. I do think that, that people of faith have uh, perhaps a different dimension. Uh, the one place I would say for me that I'm not, I'm not sure if it's any different uh, is that uh, I'm actually not fearful of, of what happens after I die. Um, I don't know what heaven looks like, how it works, but you know, I figure uh, God will take care of that. And all I know is that the God who has been good to me all my life will continue to be good uh, to me, and, and that's all I need to know. Um, I'm not totally sure how a humanist or um, those who have left faith behind or whatever uh, would answer that. But for me, uh, that's, a, that's actually a source of, of great strength and, and uh, serenity uh, because I'm not worried about some sort of punitive God uh, smacking me around uh, after I die. Uh, good, I'm not either. Uh, <laughs> let, let, you've started on this, this personal road and we just got time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, what are you, if you don't mind talking about this, what are you doing to prepare for your own death? Yeah, so, um, I have just recently uh, updated uh, my will, all the powers of attorney, all the uh, standing orders for, uh, you know, I, I've made it really clear with my two daughters that uh, I am not one of those people who want to be kept alive at all cost. That if I am able to participate in that, I expect to be participating in those decisions. But I, I have been quite clear with them that if they should make a decision on my behalf, that they are not to feel guilty about that, that I trust that they will make the best decision that they can, and um, uh, I will be loving them right, right through it. Um, I also have, um, uh, I have uh, my funeral planned. Um, really good Anglican music, I might say. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> That's not a knock on Presbyterian music. No, take, of course it? not. Uh, and actually, one of the things that the Episcopal Church does really, really well are funerals. <laughs> I'm just saying, so you know. We do too. And you know, <laughs> you want to arm wrestle? <laughs> So I think every time you do something like that, have a, have a discussion with a kid, um, plan your funeral, uh, go to your lawyer and get these things in place. It, it just makes it possible uh, to talk about this more easily. Like it's not a crisis, it's an opportunity, right? If, if we could all learn to talk about this a little more honestly, I think we would learn a lot from each other. I mean, I'd love to know what, you, what your definition of dignity is. You know, I might add something to my list if I knew, except we're just afraid to talk about it. So every time I do one of those things to prepare for my own death, I, I feel uh, more at ease about uh, talking about this whole, this whole uh, subject. And, uh, and the more I think about it, the more I do about it, uh, the more I want this option. And um, so, like I said, I've become politically active uh, in the District of Columbia uh, so that I don't have to move to Vermont, where my daughter lives, in order to take advantage of this, of this option. Thank you, Bishop Gene Robinson.